In today's video, we're delving into the 3ds Max physical camera. We're going to break down every adjustment so that by the end, you've got all the answers you need. If you want to level up your skills, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. You won't want to miss any of the upcoming tutorials. Now let's not waste any time and get right into it. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using Grant Warwick's shader ball, which is for his mastering CGI course. All right, how to create a camera. To create a camera, you have two easy ways and one difficult one that I'm going to be skipping. For the first one, you can go to the create tab, then cameras and select the physical camera right from here and just drop it wherever you want simply by dragging and dropping it into the scene, preferably in the top view. Now by pressing the C button on your keyboard in any of the views, you can go into your camera view. Now if you start panning in this view, you're basically moving the camera. The second way is to find the perfect starting point to have your camera in the perspective view. And once you found it, just press Ctrl and C on your keyboard to create a new camera. As simple as that. So let's get rid of the second one and continue with the first one. Now let's head to the modify panel and go through the adjustments. First of all, we have the targeted option. If we have this enabled, which it actually is by default, we will have a target attached to our camera. By moving it around, you can change your camera direction and get different views. It's perfect for fine tuning your compositions. And also, you can decide where would your focus point be in the scene, which I will be talking about a little bit later in this video. Now, if you don't want to have the target in your viewport, you can simply disable it from here and adjust your focus point by changing the target distance. The next option is show cone, which is not really that important, but it has three different options and it's for you to see the field of view of your camera in the viewport. They're pretty much self-explanatory, so we're not going to go more in details. The next one is show horizon line. So if I go to the wireframe mode and enable it, you can see where the horizon is. This comes in handy when you're trying to match your camera with an existing photo, especially the aerial ones, where you have to match the horizon in the photo with the horizon in your 3D scene. Or when you want to change the background, you need to match the horizon in the photo with this one, so the result is looking more accurate and realistic. Now we have the physical camera options. The first one is the film or sensors preset. By default, we're using a 35 mm full frame lens, but we have the option to choose from other type of sensors. So if I choose one of the other types, which have different width, we will have a different crop. Let's say this APS-C sensor, which is 22.3 mm, should give us a smaller crop since the sensor is smaller. But as you can see, nothing is changing because we're using the field of view instead of the focal length. So if I change this option to focal length, you can see by changing the preset, we will have different crops. I would usually go with a 35 mm lens unless I want to match my camera with an existing photo that's been taken with a different type of sensor. In that case, it's necessary to use the correct type in order to match the camera perfectly. Now next option, which is the focal length. The focal length is basically the distance between the lens and the sensor of the camera. As we go higher with the focal length, we will have a narrower field of view. We're basically zooming in without losing any of the quality. And as we decrease the distance or focal length, we'll have a greater field of view and it's usually great for landscape photography where you don't have a specific object in the scene as your focal point. The important tip is the perspective is not changing during this process. We're basically covering a larger or a smaller area in the shot. And I need to mention that a 50 mm focal length on a full frame sensor, which is 35 mm, is the closest field of view to what the human eye sees. Now if we enable the field of view, we won't be able to change the focal length anymore. And we can only specify a certain angle that we want to have. If I put it on 90 degrees, the camera will cover a 90 degrees field of view. And if I go with 45, we will have a 45 degrees field of view. I personally prefer to use the focal length because I can understand what type of lens I'm using for any shot. The zoom option is also similar to the focal length. It wouldn't change the perspective. You can simply zoom in or out and it only works if you're using the focal length, not the field of view. The next one is aperture and it simply is the opening of the camera lens. 
It determines how much light enters your camera and hits the image sensor. It's measured in an f-stop number. Basically, a smaller f-stop number means a larger opening, which leads to more light, brighter image, and more depth of field. While on the other hand, larger f number means smaller opening, less light, and darker image, also less depth of field effect. The next option is the use target distance, which is enabled by default, which means our focus point will be at this distance or where the camera's target is located in the scene. But if I put it on custom, uh, we can change the focus point manually. In this case, we have the target on the subject, but the focus point is way in the back over here. So if I don't want to change the target's position, that might mess with my composition, uh, you can simply just change the focus point from here. As easy as that. You can see that as I'm changing the focus distance, my field of view is changing, and this is caused by the lens breathing or focus breathing. And it happens when the lens is trying to adjust itself to focus on different subjects in different distances. If you're working on animations, you might uh, face this issue, and to get rid of it, you can just simply put this on zero, and as you can see, it's been disabled. Now if I have the depth of field enabled and run a render, you can see how a different aperture size will affect the depth of field in my render. As I said, the lower F number leads to a shallower depth of field, and as I go higher, I will get a wider depth of field. Let me just put the exposure on manual or ISO so you can see how the aperture size can affect the brightness of the image as well. Alright, as I said before, larger aperture will lead more light into the camera and give us a brighter image, while a smaller aperture will give us a darker image. Basically, three adjustments are affecting the brightness of the image. The first one is the aperture, which we've already covered. The second one is the shutter speed. And the third one is the ISO. In the shutter adjustments, uh, we have four different options. Basically, the shutter speed is the speed of opening and closing your shutter. The longer it is open, the more light will hit the sensor and you will have a brighter image and vice versa. With a longer shutter speed, you will also get more motion blur in your shot. I have another video dedicated to depth of field and motion blur where I explained everything about them and how to put them into work to get exactly what you're looking for. And you can find the video right here. I'll put the link into the descriptions also. And please make sure to watch that because I think this is one of the most important topics that you need to know about the physical camera. All right, the next topic is the exposure. For this one, we have two options. The first one is ISO. So ISO is basically the sensitivity of your film or sensor. The more sensitive it is, it absorbs the light much faster and will make your image brighter. And the less sensitive it is, it makes the image a bit darker. So you always need to work your way with a combination of the three factors that I mentioned earlier to get the best exposure for your shot. For instance, when you're trying to take a photo at night, usually you need to use a higher ISO so you have a brighter image. But the downside is uh, we need to avoid higher ISO numbers since it will make the photos a bit more noisier than usual. That's why you might need to use a longer exposure time uh, with a longer shutter speed and the downside is you'll have more motion blur happening in your photo. Or you might need to have a better lens with a larger aperture and the con is higher price that you need to pay for that lens, but in Max that's not an issue for us. That's why it's really important to learn how to control these three factors in real life photography. But here in Max we have another option that is called exposure value and takes the headaches away and makes everything much easier. So basically, you can have a fixed exposure value here, and no matter what you change in the camera, the exposure or brightness of your image will stay the same. Okay, to the next one, which is the white balance. Let's say you're rendering the scene with a lot of warm lights or cold lights, and you want the image to have a more natural color. Here is where you can fix it. Basically, as you go higher with the Kelvin temperature, your image will get warmer and the lower number will make the image look colder. This is something that depends on your scene, so you need to just give it a try and see what number works the best for your scene. You can also go with the custom color and as I said, it depends on your scene. 
All right, to the next one, and uh, it is vignetting. What does it mean is that it will create a gradual darkening or shading around the image. It actually happens naturally in some of the lenses and it could be also added in the post-production process for artistic purposes, such as uh, drawing attention to the center of the image. I personally prefer to avoid it in the max and just do it in post-production because if you change your mind after rendering the image, uh, you might not be able to get rid of it that easily. Okay, to the next one and it is bokeh effect. If you look at this image, you can see it's happening in the out of focus areas of the image where we have some bright lights or reflections. In this case, I need to put the sphere out of focus and for that, I will change my focus distance to somewhere around here. Now, if I render this region where we have the sun's reflection, you can see that the bokeh effect is happening. By default, it is circular, but you can change it to bladed and make a custom aperture shape. You can change the blades to a custom number and you'll have the same shape as your bokeh. The other option is to use a custom texture. You can find some on Richard's website and I will put the link into the description if you wanna go and check it out. Okay, the next one is perspective control. First two options are for shifting the lens. Let's say you have this camera, but you want to slightly change your composition without moving the camera. You can simply shift your lens horizontally and vertically to fine tune your shot. You can also tilt the camera in both directions as well. We usually use the vertical tilt, but when you have some horizontal lines in the scene that aren't perfectly horizontal, you can fix those with the horizontal tilt. The only problem is that your image will get distorted after using this option. So I would recommend not to overdo it from here. Maybe you need to fix the problem with moving the camera and adjusting your composition manually. We can do the same thing for the vertical lines as well, which is pretty common in architectural photography. If you look at some architectural photos, you will notice that all the vertical lines are completely vertical. I wouldn't say it's a must, but it's pretty common. So if I go higher with the number here, the vertical lines are getting straighter and more perpendicular to the ground. But the easier way is to just enable the auto vertical tilt correction. Now we have the lens distortion and it's off by default. But if I put it on cubic, I have the option to control the amount of distortion from here. Positive values produce a barrel distortion, while negative values produce a pillow distortion. Okay, the last option we're gonna talk about is the clipping planes. Let's say that you want to render a very small room, like a bathroom. If you put the camera inside the room, you need to use a very low focal length in order to capture everything that you want to see, and it will cause a lot of distortion in your image. Uh, what you can do is to move the camera outside of the room, use a reasonable focal length, and simply enable the clipping planes, and increase this number so you have your near plane inside the room. And now you basically removed whatever is behind this near plane and you can see inside the room. Same logic applies to the far plane and if you move it closer, everything behind it will get invisible. Okay guys, I think I've covered all the important parts of the physical camera, but please watch this one, which is very, very important. If you like this one, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you up in the next one.